Good morning. We are back with Community Views and Solutions. Glad to have you with us as we give you information, some scientific, some from a practitioner standpoint, some from the community standpoint, and some from the professional standpoint. My name is Charles X. White, your host with Charity Productions. Mark Pirtle is our executive, not the executive producer, but he does it all. All right, today's conversation and discussion, we're going to pick up a little bit uh, on where we left off last week with flooding, but we're going to take it to another dimension. We're going to add some scale and scope to the discussion. There were four in my research. There were four major events that happened in America that challenged America to improve its service delivery. One was crack cocaine in the 1980s, 85. Some people say 86. 2001, 9-11. 2005, Hurricane Katrina. 2017, Hurricane Tropical Storm Harvey. These four events are different events in, in time that force some policy changes, money changes, and service changes. We're going to look at the dimensions that a man-made disaster or a natural disaster, how it can impact you in your house and your pocketbook. We're going to look at a first clip, and this is a public health clip. However, I want you to think about Houston. Mark, could you let us have the first clip? The world has got to change. I live in a community that was so prosperous with doctors and lawyers and politicians. Now we have drug dealers and corner stores that they don't sell anything but the wrong things. You cannot deny the impact that it has on people's health. I have been in West Baltimore my entire life. As far as money, my mother didn't have any money. I don't want to say she was poor, I'll say low income. Poor we were though. In the 50s, we didn't have many choices as far as health care. The health care system then was limited. It was not good for us. And medicine costing so much that my family says sometimes, will I eat or will I pay for my medicine? Which one do you mommy? Oh, I just love my daughters when they come over and we get together and we cook and prepare meals together. It's healthy meals. When my oldest went to college, she came back with a different diet. Now what happens is, if I do a meatloaf, it's turkey instead of ground beef. You know, I make spaghetti, I make chili, stuff like that. It's with turkey and chicken. We grew up, we ate pork. Um, we ate bacon, we ate a fresh shoulder, we ate pork chops. I did not think it was not healthy eating. Right. Because this is what we were accustomed to. I, I was in denial. I didn't want to face the fact that I was becoming a diabetic. The impact is the fact that my family ended up with heart disease, emphysema, diabetes, cancer. My mother's sister, her daughter died of diabetes. She was an amputee. My mother died of a massive heart attack. And whew. To address health disparities, we need to understand why they exist, that they're not due to one single factor. They're the result of policy decisions we make as a society. They're due to the environment, health education, insurance and access to care, access to healthy food, and stress. Those stresses are actually experienced disproportionately by people who are poor and people who uh, have been historically disadvantaged in this society. Solutions to these problems cannot just be medical, it's systemic. And that means everybody has to get involved. If we want a nation to be strong, the people in that nation have to be healthy. They have to be well. 
If there's anything that we can do to stamp out disparities, we need to do it by any means necessary. Hi, Ms. Simmons. Hi, Doctor. Here at East Baltimore Medical Center, most of the patients are underserved. We need nice deep breaths in and up through your mouth. Michelle is a terrific success story. There was actually a year where she had lost her job, and before she found a new one, she had no health insurance. And she still managed to buy her medicines out of pocket, paid out of pocket to come and have doctor visits. She was really invested in her own health. That's something that Dr. Cooper's research is looking at, why patients don't invest in their health like we wish they would. The next thing on the agenda is the community update, so I'm going to turn Michelle joined our community advisory board in 2011. We provide education to the community about health and about research. We offer training programs for community health workers. We can be sure that we are meeting the needs of people appropriately and that we're not leaving out certain groups of people that have traditionally not been included in conversations related to health and health care. Our strong relationship with the community is just essential. There's no way that we could do what we're doing without their input. And my work is just one of many initiatives here at Hopkins. Good to see you too. Ms. Simmons is a great example of what happens when we get it right as clinicians and as an institution. I am a fighter. I am a believer. I stand for what's right. And what's right is people's health. And I will never give up as long as I have breath in my body. One of the things that is so important is that people have what I call a liberated future. And it's hard to be liberated when you're not healthy. When I say liberated, I mean freedom to be all that God meant for you to be. When we don't deal with disparities, then what we're doing is denying people an opportunity to give back to the world. And so we've got to fight it. We've got to fight it with everything we've got. That particular clip is designed to give you a focus. Uh, Mark, could you go to the first clip, uh, first slide? Sorry. There's a discussion, as Jim Blackburn put it in his uh, presentation or discussion uh, last week, where it's an elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is or can be described in words like inequities, disparities, marginalized, low performing, and intergenerational. It's, it's probably at least a hundred word phrases and words that describes a condition that's fixable, it's solvable, there have been trillions of dollars spent on the war on drug, the war on poverty, the war on education, the war on housing, the war on the war. But we still have a significant population that stays in the same spot, condition, and rut. Before we go to the next slide, I want to make this point about the elephant in the room. A service description of the elephant in the room is poor service. Tax dollars not being utilized efficiently. That's another elephant in the room. The elephant in the room metaphor is very appropriate for to describe what we see as a service provider, service gaps. And these gaps have grown over the last 75 years. As it was noted in that, in that uh, John Hopkins clip, is that black people are at the top and the bottom of the charts, health, education, housing, economics, job. Why? It's a solvable problem. Next slide. Next slide. This is a percentage in the different categories, public health, public education, public safety, uh, public housing, 
these categories are the fixable categories that we just, we are working with. One of our partners, Texas A&M University, has become a very strong advocate and gap-filling institution on how to take fact-based scientific information and turn it into a programmatic evaluation system that people on the ground can't understand. When I say people on the ground, I mean John and Jane Q. Citizen. John and Jane Q. Citizen, in this particular uh, note of history called Harvey, it was a lot made on how people were helping people. Hell, people have been helping people ever since the flood in the Bible. So that's not new. Was, was, I think it was overblown for another reason. But people helping people, people came to each other's aid in Ike, Tropical Storm, uh, Allison, uh, Rita, uh, just any number of disasters because Houston is in a hot zone of multiple ongoing climate disasters, heat, cold, rain, you name it. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Now, about 2010, Charity Productions took this map that was originally produced by the City of Houston Health Department. That color that you see on that map identified the City of Houston Health Department and other departments used this map to identify what is known as vulnerable populations. Now, this is a city drawn configuration. Next slide. At Charity Productions, we have a food bank, mobile food bank that we have located in different parts of the city. We host the largest civic engagement meeting, informational and training in the state of Texas. You see at one time in this particular slide, we have interaction and partnership with co-sponsorships with companies like Fiesta, uh, Reliant Energy, and we also do mitigation and feel all hazard field exercises. So those are some of the on the ground services that we provide. Next slide. Now, this particular set of diagrams and maps, on the left side with the yellow uh, on the, the, the single map, that is zip codes in the footprint that was described by the city of Houston. And this was done in 2016. The one with the city was done without zip codes in 2010 by the city, city of Houston. Now what we did was took that footprint and we applied it to other disparities, other inequities, other low performance service delivery systems in those same zip codes that were labeled vulnerable. So the two slides you see next to that deal with education and housing, I believe. Next slide. The, this is all four. This is crime, public health, public safety, public education, and public housing. The same footprint basically exists. This is not new knowledge. This is not new information. This is compounded year after year information, census after census information. And there's been a lot of initiatives, but not a lot of pro sustainable programmatic application. What we feel at Charity Productions, what's missing is a link direct to the researchers and the universities being that particular entity where the citizen can be connected direct to the information to improve the citizen's advocacy based on facts, not what I feel, not what I heard, 
but the data shows, the big data analytic has this particular footprint, and that's what you print. That's what you advocate. And we take that with some guidance from the, the public policy makers and the institutions, and we create an improved public policy that closes that gap. Now, it's, 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 it, it may not be as simple as I made it sound, but those are the steps. So today we have with us two professors from Texas A&M Universities, and I want to introduce our first guest, uh, Professor Phil Burke from the Institute for Sustainable Communities, and he's going to talk to you about, and, and us, about what the target capabilities and the institute are doing with Houston and how we are interacting, trying to put the pieces and process, because that's what takes time, is assembling the process of, for sustainable solutions. And Dr. Burke, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing very well. Well, let the Houston audience, and you know we, this, this can go worldwide, because we have that capacity. Just give us an uh, uh, introduction and an overview or, or specifics on how the Institute engages uh, and advocates and uh, provides service uh, with our partnership with you, with Charity Productions, and how, uh, and Warren will be here, not today though, uh, you know, with Tejas, so just give, the because sometimes people have the university, or, or the university is just cosmic to, you know, well, well, let's make it human to them. Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you for um, uh, having me here. And uh, we feel this is a great opportunity to get the word out about what we do, and we think it's somewhat unique in how we work. and. Uh, the kinds of uh, research, education, and community engagement, which is very important. And the Institute for Sustainable Communities uh, uh, started a few years ago at Texas A&M. And uh, if I can show the next slide. And who are we? I wanted to get kind of a brief overview of how, what we're about, our mission, and maybe an example of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of one of the activities that reflects what we do in Houston. Uh, we're an interdisciplinary group. We started off small, as you can see on, this, on the picture here. And uh, we, we, we come from the faculty and the students come from uh, different colleges within the university, from architecture, engineering, geosciences, public health, and A&M Galveston's marine sciences. And we work together on various projects um, and uh, in terms of uh, trying to pull people to get together to work across these different disciplines. It sounds like you were talking about public policy and making change. It sounds like it's easy, but trying to get uh, a, uh, somebody in urban planning out of architecture, maybe to talk to somebody in public health and work together to engineering, it's all, it's, it can be complicated. Oh, yes. And uh, very complicated. So we try to do that. And we're, we organize ourselves across uh, the different colleges, and here are the folks. We have these different leads uh, for different areas of discovery from, uh, uh, from uh, environment and, and, and health to uh, uh, water security to uh, coastal risk like, like hurricanes and storms and to creating more resilient and sustainable communities. That's actually design on the ground. How do you make a, a vital a vibrant uh, neighborhoods, that type of thing. Next slide. And what I want to do is kind of briefly talk about our mission. Um, the middle slide, I think, is particularly important on this, if you can see oh, yeah. on the picture here. That's right in Houston, um, in Manchester neighborhood. And uh, we work with Juan Padas and Tejas and his group. Uh, we started a few years ago. And we're now working with Charity Productions. And what is it that we do that I mentioned that's unique? Um, it's unique, I think, at the university and, and many, many other universities. Uh, we try to combine this interdisciplinary research that I mentioned uh, with fundamental community engagement. We actually try to go deep down into the communities, and not for a semester or an academic year, but for many years, 
um, and try to develop trust and partnerships so that we can uh, do research that I call as action oriented. We try to translate the findings and actually, not just the findings, but actually involve the community in helping us collect the data, analyze the data, and interpret the data in terms of in ways that, that uh, is framed so that the, our community partners can use the information in an actionable way. And so I think we've developed a, a, a history of that in Houston now for the last three or four years we've been working. And uh, the other aspect, so the other uh, 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 leg on our three, three, uh, three leg mission is experiential learning. And we particularly, on part of the students at Texas A&M, um, many of them don't have an advantage. Uh, they get their degree, they do their uh, research, uh, uh, come out of the university, and are able to publish uh, uh, a well-regarded article, for example, in the scientific community. Well, that's good, and that's critical that the university needs to do. But how do they take that information and translate it? What kind of experience? We try to give our students the experience to work with other disciplines, and but just as importantly, perhaps even more importantly, in doing their work is to engage the community and work with community partners. Let me ask you on that particular. Uh, what you just said, is is it also, it, does it fix in the category of that community participatory research model? Yes, it's, yes, it, it very much does. It, uh, uh, where we're actually working with communities as partners and we, we actually become participants along with our partners in the process of understanding the issues, um, creating solutions to those issues. Um, and, and it's just not us, you know, as dis disconnected researchers, we're actually working disconnected. with our partners. Disconnected, because right. the historical narrative is universities, because with my involvement just in Houston, the first time that, that I remember a company, it was Amoco, mm -hmm. Amoco's foundation, came to Sunnyside and uh, we did all the table stop, top workshops and had all the paper around the room and they got the community's input and grants were written, but the community, one, did not receive the benefit of the service that the research provided and two, the community didn't receive any jobs out of it. What we experienced in Houston is that the service provider, uh, it's like the big box stores. The big box stores put out a lot of mom and pop hardware stores. And when the big box agencies started applying for grants along with city departments, it shrunk the, the community-based service provider or community-based uh, organization. So that field shrunk because it was saturated with grant applications from the higher groups. And at, at Charity Productions, what we hope is to add another dimension with the partnership that we have is that we will apply for certain fundings, public and private funding, sources that's going to not only provide the sustainability of the research because we can always upgrade and evaluate the performance of what the baseline data says but we want to be able to hire some, I saw one one group one department inside the city of Houston and I've seen several but I'm going to point out this one went from 3 employees to 12 in a five-year period because they kept writing grants based on the input they got for communities. Now to me, a better way to have done that was to hire six of the people from the community and six of the people that work for the city. That would have been a better blend to deal with sustainable solutions because you have, to me, you have to have an incubator idea attached to the research 
that's going to make the sustainability factor stronger. The university, university can provide evaluation ongoing and help and assist with refining grants for new grants, and then the community can grow with staff and help maintain the problem and bridge the gap, because there's a service gap between the citizen and the, and the city, or the citizens and the state, or the citizens and the county, because they don't have the manpower. They are all shrinking. And the solution that the government uses is privatizing. Well, why don't you privatize to the, some of the retired teachers that's in the neighborhood, the retired nurses, the retired public works people? You still have people that want to work and contribute. So you blend the benefit of the research and you grow the service index and customer service, even though we know that government is not the best expression for customer service. So I, I'm appreciative. Now I want to get back to that project you did with uh, Tejas. Yes. That was an article that came out in the Houston Chronicle. And they diagram all of the underground piping from the petrochemical company and all the others that had, and said that at any, is, the question is not if, but when the, the, the one of these pipes are going to erupt. And Tejas is in the heart of that potential danger. So how, how is, uh, is that project going? Okay, well, I think uh, uh, the speaker after me, Dr. Horney, is gonna, has, has a project specifically looking Correct. at public health impacts. There's a slide, though, that I, w I would like to say that does is related to what your question. And uh, this is a uh, project on uh, uh, community-based participatory research. We call it citizen science as well because we actually try to train folks in the neighborhood to actually participate in the science, the scientific process. And this is a study that w was funded by the National Science Foundation the uh, principal investigator, I want to give a shout out to him, Dr. Nasir Garibe in the uh, Department of Civil Engineering at A&M, and he linked with scholars from the public health school, urban planning, and what, they tr what they're doing, as you can see in the diagram here, or in the, in the, uh, in the visual, is that uh, uh, th there's a student there who's getting his doctorate. His name is Marcus Hendricks. Yes, he's I met from, Marcus. Yes, he's from... He's from inner city Dallas. He uh, uh, is, is gone a long, come a long, long way. He's now an assistant professor at the University of Maryland. We're very proud of him. But his, his work, his research involved uh, looking at neighborhood infrastructure. And one of the most important facets of neighborhood infrastructure is stormwater drainage. If the, if the, water, the stormwater drainage system in the neighborhood doesn't work, then you'll get constant flooding, you'll get, and the floodwaters won't go away, you'll get suspended, you'll get pools that are sitting that can um, uh, be, uh, uh, support uh, diseases like uh, Zika virus, that kind of thing, um, but also they can uh, attract pollutants. And uh, so how, but the neighborhoods like Manchester get ditches uh, where other neighborhoods have curb and gutter. So the ditches that have to be maintained by the neighborhood, uh, and how well are they working? Uh, there's not regular monitoring of them. And uh, so what we've trained the students from Fur High School, 30 wonderful students, high school students, called the Green Ambassadors out of the high school, and many of them live in the neighborhood. We've trained them to say, well, after it rains, and for days and weeks after it rains, to go in and evaluate how well the stormwater drainage infrastructure is working. And they're using new technology where they can take their iPhones, their cell phones, take a picture and upload it into a cloud in the data, and they evaluate based on a protocol for data collection how well the different segments of the stormwater drainage is working in their neighborhood. And uh, this, is, uh, this information now is being used by the community. Um, 
We've also uh, used the information to better design the community so that it can better reduce the threat from, from stormwater drains that don't work very well. So we had landscape architecture students do work and come up with some designs that the community could use. The students from the high school actually were active in the actual designs of improving, we call it green spaces. Can you create green spaces that better handle stormwater and get it out of the neighborhood rather than have it sit, even if the stormwater infrastructure isn't um, working the way it should? And can these be shovel-ready projects mm -hmm. um, that the neighborhood could, could use? So it won an award, a national award from the uh, uh, American Society of Landscape Architects, uh, Architecture. And uh, so the students in the neighborhood were active and involved in it, as well as the students from Texas A&M. Well, I'm glad you brought that seemingly small point mm -hmm. to a grand scale. Mm -hmm. It's not easy and it's complicated. Yes, it sounds all nice, but it's hard, yes. And I, I want to say that we appreciate the university's involvement because we know that there are special interests, political interests, and policy development that is part of that process that it gets complicated, mm -hmm. which is out of your hands. However, I think it's so significant that the community have a product to advocate. To me, and, 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 I'm, and I'm sharing this with the audience, what we are talking about is a, a package a prototype, a design based on science, based on top minds at the university level that understand how to develop what in Houston is called an area plan. And an area plan that could fit with the city ordinance that deals with a general plan. There's been a lot of discussion because the general plan has been on the book a long time, and there's been a resurgence uh, to try to uh, make mention of the general plan and area plan. But the citizen is at the table too late, or the conversation is over the citizen's head, or the citizen is not at the table where the real decisions are made. A document like you all have created in partnership with Charity Productions will add in the public domain a scientific argument, advocacy tool that people that we don't even know can pick up this tool based on science, based on uh, modern scale, and we can advocate that. We haven't had that before in most neighborhoods across this country, they don't have this. And when they do have it, it's isolated into a small group. Now that brings me to our next professor because our next professor really can elaborate on as Professor Burke talked about infrastructure, she can really talk about social infrastructure, social capital, community capital, in the form of her research and talk about it from that standpoint. And we have Professor Jennifer Horney. How are you doing this morning? Good, thank you. Are you ready to talk to Houston? I'm ready. Are you ready to talk to the world, the globe? <laughs> You are on cue. All right. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I've been part of the work uh, that Phil has led with the Institute for Sustainable Communities um, since the beginning, I guess about four years ago. And I really wanted to talk about how the more general ideas that Phil talked about, community engaged research, um, training the next generation of, of high school students and university students, 
can really be realized in a funded project um, that we just were awarded at Texas A&M um, just a week after Harvey hit Houston um, this year. So that project is called the Superfund Research Center. It's one of 16 research centers looking at Superfund sites and Superfund contaminants across the U.S. Um, next slide. So Phil mentioned that the Institute has sort of a three-part uh, mission, and that's really to um, translate research, provide solutions for communities, and create high-impact experiences for students. So I'm going to just use the Superfund, since that's one of our new projects, to give some examples about how we do that. Next slide. So the Superfund Research Centers are sort of unique because they are designed by the National Institute for Environmental Health Science, which is the funder, to include both research projects as well as community engagement and research translation cores. So the Superfund program is actually having its 30th anniversary this year. We'll be at a conference in a few weeks um, to celebrate that. But it's unique in the sense that it actually has a requirement for the researchers to link to the communities. So when we had the opportunity to submit this proposal um, and I was asked to lead the community engagement core, it was natural that we build on the progress that had been made with the Institute for Sustainable Communities um, to design that community engagement core and research translation work. Um, and so our work in the community engagement for core really focuses on two issues, and those are uh, exposure risk assessments and community-based sampling. So next slide, please. Uh, one more. This just sort of uh, shows you how the, the, the project links together. And so we've been doing a number of projects as part of the Superfund Research Center. We've been in communities um, in Sunnyside and in Manchester um, and surrounding communities since Hurricane Harvey, um, collecting information from residents via surveys, collecting um, soil and water samples to try and ascertain what sorts of contaminants are in there. Again, to build that baseline of data that Charles and Juan and other groups who work uh, closely with the community can use um, as evidence to advocate for policy changes. So I just wanted to um, mention one uh, project that our um, research translation core was taking part in a few weeks ago, and this was the um, the monitoring of the environment uh, in Baytown around the, in Crosby, around the Arkema plant, which everyone um, is probably well aware yeah. of, was uh, exploded a bit after Hurricane Harvey. Um, and so Arkema actually had um, a, a very well known and respected laboratory to collect samples, environmental samples around the lab and test those. Um, and it's, this kind of work is really complex and um, there are some days when I just want to go back to doing my community surveys and not think about this uh, environmental sampling anymore because you have to be able to answer a lot of really hard questions before you can inform people about what risks they might face from their environment. So we need to know what we're looking for. We cannot just come into a community or a site and look for everything. We have to think about what are the most likely types of contaminants that might be there and design the sampling and the analysis um, in order to be able to show that they are there. Um, and it's very expensive. Um, so we can talk a lot with residents about their perceptions um, there's a lot of data on the types of chemicals and other contaminants that residents of Houston are exposed to, um, but we want to be able to document that with laboratory testing, and so that can be expensive. Um, and so Arkema did some testing after the, um, this test, and so on the previous slide, uh, what we had was actually just comparing that uh, data from the testing after Harvey to the um, ongoing air quality monitoring, which is, is always happening in different sites in Houston. So this is from the Baytown Monitor. And you'll see this, and this, this information is publicly available. 
Um, but it's not really meaningful to anyone unless they have a PhD in toxicology and they're very well versed in the uh, calculations that the EPA and TCEQ would like for us to use to interpret them. Um, so we were actually asked to take a look at the report as uh, technical experts as part of our super fund. And then on the next slide, what you'll see is something a little bit more interpretable, which is that um, we really did see maximum PM 2.5. So these are these very small particles of particulate matter that get into people's lungs after um, from, from air pollution. And what you do see is that during that post-Harvey period, um, there were some very high maximum levels of PM 2.5. Um, and so again, I think Phil brings up, this seems like a small thing, um, and this is a very incremental step because I want to know, and if I live in Crosby, I want to know, so what does that mean to my health? If I'm exposed to these higher levels of PM5, higher than the maximum daily for a certain period of time, what does that mean for me in the long run? And the answer is we don't really know. Um, those kinds of calculations are complex and based on individuals and based on you know, various bits. But we want people to have the data. Uh, we want people to be able to access the data that is available about the environment that they live and work in. Um, so that they will be empowered to both take action themselves to remediate that as well as advocate for policy changes um, that can help improve the environment. You, in that process that you just mentioned, you also assist in your report when you engage with the community strategies to address or mitigate, right? Yeah, but I think one of the biggest concerns is that we're coming to work in communities that have been experiencing this gap, right? right? That you've said has been documented, you've said and we know has been documented over time. And so I'm not satisfied going to these communities after we take samples and conduct analysis and say, here's what you need to do. You go out and buy an air purifier. You go out and buy a water filter. You go out and buy topsoil to add to your lawn so that you can not track in contaminants. So yes, that might be an intermediate step, but I don't think that the communities that we work with are really looking for another opportunity to perform that type of mitigation themselves. So we really need to push beyond those sorts of individual interventions and go more towards these policy Correct. level implementation. Um, because I don't think it's fair to basically ask people to live in an environment which is not high quality and then also burden them to subsidize the remediation of that. Some of that has to be done in the short term, but the long term has to be looking at bigger solutions at a city level or a state level. And the re one of the reasons that the situation got like it got as a result of not including the citizens in the mitigation process, information process, and how to make this a quality is just kind of like, I, you know, the carpet uh, carpet bagger syndrome where they come in and take, 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 take. So it is it, it has to be a joint venture long term with data, process, public policy. And then you have to engage and form the citizens that are in that set. And again, I can't say too much uh, about how we are, are excited about what we're doing with the university in this, this building block process. Because here's the a, here's a thing, there's a group of citizens, baby boomers, that can bridge a process gap with the millennials and the millennials can bridge a process gap with the baby boomers. Because when the millennials take over, if we chronicle all this what we're doing now, there will be archived data for research that's accessible to the taxpayer, the community, 
from now and in the future. And the millennials will be able to utilize the data and express it better than the boomers. Uh, and, you know, some, 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 of, some of those boomers, you know, I think I'm in X generation. But in, anyway, I, I want you to elaborate a little bit on the survey that you did at the breakfast and how that, that. Okay, so I want to actually talk about two, two pieces of information. So one of the things that we're working on in our community engagement core as part of Superfund is to actually build a website and an application where any resident of Houston would be able to find out, I live here, I live in this block, I live in this zip code, what data is available about my exposure to particular environmental contaminants. And that'll be, um, there's a lot of data out there, but it's not in the hands of your average citizen or resident. Um, and so that's one, one way that we're doing that. So another opportunity that we had, again, we're always thinking about data, but another opportunity we had was to come and be guests at the Charity Productions Community Breakfast back in October. Yeah, October the 5th. October the 5th. And so one thing that we wanted to look at is there's a standard um, health assessment which asks people about their perceptions of their physical and mental health. And it's used all across the country. And so we can compare any population that takes this survey to the national averages. So we actually did a similar survey in Manchester about three years ago as part of uh, one of the institute's doctoral students' dissertation. Um, and we found something uh, very interesting when we surveyed the folks at the community breakfast. And that was we expect uh, older residents of environmental justice neighborhoods of Houston to have lower perceived physical health. So these are things like, you know, are you able to, to do all the activities that you would like to do? Or has a physician told you that you have certain diagnoses? But what we did not expect to see was that the mental health was actually above average. And so we thought that that was very interesting and we started looking at some of the literature and connections to a community group and being engaged in community building activities are actually something that's protective to people's mental health. So we had folks who were at a community organizing event. They were at a community breakfast. Um, and what we saw is that they're getting a mental health benefit from that even when we're talking about something that's one month after Harvey impacted Houston. So the next step would be to do some data collection over time. Fortunately, we have community breakfasts on a regular basis, charity production does. So we can continue to look at that, see if that was something that was particularly associated with Hurricane Harvey, um, or if that's an ongoing benefit to being engaged in community organizing and community activities. Um, and we'd also like to go into the community and survey some people who don't come to community activities. Everybody comes. Haven't been. You won't find any. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> who haven't been engaged in these types of community activities related to disaster mitigation and emergency preparedness and find out if they're missing that benefit, right? So if we can find out if they're missing that benefit or we can see change over time, and we really have a lot of evidence for advocating for some policy changes. And 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 that was, uh, as Phil mentioned, what you, you said that's uh, quantifiable. Yeah, yeah. Phil. Oh, yeah. I'm. I get excited when I listen to Jen talk um, about her research, and it's so important. And it's she has several projects. She's just talking about the the one here right. is involved in Houston. And the Institute overall, we have a variety of projects. And this is what we do. And Dr. Horney represents uh, the best of what we do. And, uh, and we have a, a variety of other kinds of projects that we're trying to, we, we look forward to working with charity productions and other, other neighborhoods throughout the city. So, 
One thing I want to point out when you talked about, uh, it brought my mind to the uh, TECQ when you were talking about your study. As an example, wh what we intend to do with the partnership is to take your data from Crosby meet with the Crosby people and TECQ and try to get when when TECQ makes an assessment for a fine we want to try to create for the Crosby area or whatever the whatever the fine area is when they uh, for if an, uh, if an emission happens and TECQ does their study and they say, well, you're going to have to pay $100,000, whatever, whatever. We want to go to a specific neighborhood that's in that span of the emission and get TECQ to change the state policy to where that money goes to that neighborhood in a mitigation process. And your research will help that community advocate for that type of amendment. See, we're not trying to change it, but we're trying to fix it. Right, so I should point out that that's not our data, that what part of this project having a research translation, that's data that the company collected and published a big report. And so what we were trying to do was have some experts look at the report and say, what does this actually mean to anyone? Because having, you know, much like having these big um, reports uh, that say the Department of State Health Services puts out to tell you how many fish or crabs you can eat from various waterways in Houston. It's a big report, it's on their website, it's a PDF, you have to click, 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 and so we want to take those things and find the information that people need and then find a way to translate it to them. Correct. Exactly. To, to that end, to the solution. Yes. Because the people have to understand and translate the information to an actionable item. Because over the last 75 years, although the data exists somewhere on someone's shelf, it's not in an actionable item or uh, configuration for the citizen to, to actually, because, I mean, I've been to so many of these meetings in the last 40 years, the bureaucrat from that particular government is always, no, I can't use the word always, in many cases, is just not transferring the information in a usable format. Now, I'm not saying it's deliberate or whatever, whatever, it may be, but what we are doing, it shows me that added value component that it's not either or, it's not mine is better than yours, it's and and both, because we all being affected negatively by the process. And again, that's why we appreciate the, uh, the university. Now, uh, if, if we do have someone that wanted to call in, the number is 713-803-1794 and talk to our guests and ask a question, 713-803-1794. Um, how long are y'all going to be in Houston today? We just came here to do this with you. And I'm glad you are in the studio because last program, you know, we, we came to you. That's right. That's right. So uh, let's say we're about mm, four minutes or so out. Won't you have a closing remark? closing remark. We'll each take a couple of minutes for a closing remark and uh, we'll get ready for our next 11 o'clock show today. We have a 9 o'clock show and an 11 o'clock show. So come back to us at 11. We'll have uh, the professors from Sam Houston State, maybe another professor from Texas A&M, and we'll have Tracy Stevens back with us and we're going to recap some of the conversation about the flooding with Jim Blackburn. So don't go away. Now we have three minutes. Sophia, take a minute. Jen, take a minute. And I'll take a minute. And 
we thank you in the audience for viewing. Well, thank, thank you again for having us here. And we're excited to, to we're going to be moving forward on a variety of projects. Harvey is just now kind of unfolding of a sequence of just what's going to happen to the folks that live, you know, and work here in the city and are uh, engaged in our, our involvement. And, you know, we, we're going to be expanding our research uh, uh, activities here, but as, but as you've seen in this broadcast, we do the research, but we do it, you know, we give our students experiential learning, how to work with communities, and very importantly, it's all about engagement, and it's all about not going away and sticking with it year after year. Thank you. Yeah, I would just second what Phil said in that we appreciate the opportunity to continue to build the partnership um, to recognize that this is not just a one-off thing where we're coming to collect data and publish papers, that we want this to be um, a two-way street where communities are trained to collect their own data, to understand science, and to use it in the best way that they can to advocate for improving their neighborhoods. And my remark is going back to the elephant in the room. We have to understand the words word phrases, but more than understanding it, we have to put it in an actionable format that is aimed at closing the service gap. You know, when I go to certain meetings in the community, the community people feel that they are not heard and they want to just talk. They want to vent uh, before they get to what the actual problem is that they are facing. What we want to do is respect both positions, the solution scientific position and the venting, because each one of them has a place. That's why Congress debates. But for some reason or another, government has got to the point where they want to close the debate com comment section and then just present the scientific from their point of view. So we look forward for this partnership growing and providing services and information. Uh, we'll be back at 11 o'clock and continue Community Views and Solutions. This is your host, Charles X. White, Community Views and, Views and Solutions. We want to thank Professor Phil Burt, Professor Jennifer Horning from Texas A&M University, the Institute for Sustainable Communities for joining us today. We want to go to the, the, the clip, the video clip. We'll see you next, next time, 11 o'clock. We're good.